Morning, everybody. Everybody's well. Ah, uh, so good to be with you. What can I tell you? I missed you guys so much. Thanks so much for being here. Happy Wednesday for those that are here live. We are in the middle or the beginning of April. I'm in the beginning of April for those who are here with me live. Which brings spring, which means spring is coming. March Madness is officially over. Going into the world. The weather's getting better. Even in the world today, there's such a tremendous excitement. Hopefully we are emerging out of the pandemic. Everyone's healthy with God's help. Vaccines and whatnot. It's just it's just a nice it's a nice time. But these moments are always critical for us to capitalize on to grow. It's nice to watch, but it's even nicer to to join the bandwagon of momentum. Use that word. You know you picked a good word when it comes up in like a million conversations. I remember for those who are uh who who know the organization that's that is connected to this. It used to be called JWRP and I remember when they switched it to momentum. And it, that word just comes up a million times. Uh, actually, we have a retreat coming up for the, for the men. For those who are interested, please reach out to Andy for Momentum Participants. We've been talking about this idea of time. And I want to sort of delve into it a little bit more. And, and really what I wanted like to do is sort of uncover a couple of, of the things that maybe we think we know, but... It's, it's not yet in the world of the awareness, right? I just want to share a paradigm. I forgot which rabbi said it, but I, I remember reading a story from a rabbi named Rabbi Biederman. He, he publishes a weekly pamphlet called Torah Wellsprings. In there, there was a story, and I forgot which rabbi, but it was a brilliant line that he had where he spoke about the largest gap in the world, the bridge well, what is the largest bridge? Or the, let me say it better. What is the greatest bridge in the world? And the people around him like had no idea. And I'm sure he spoke about this like, you know, like in Europe in like 1820. So like they had no idea. Like they were like, I don't know, like, you know, like this, you know, the, the bridge in the local town, like they, I, they were not holding in like, you know, the world map. And he said, the, lar- the greatest bridge in the world is the bridge between your head and your heart. And I remember reading that the first time, be like, that's cute. And then thinking like, holy cow, that's like maybe the most profound thing I've ever heard in my whole life. The head to your heart. You can understand something intellectually, but getting it into your heart. And when I mean heart, I don't mean that like you feel it when you learn it. That's not what he's talking about. Getting something into your heart means that you create an awareness I remember one time a friend of mine years ago was having a little bit of a rocky start with his wife. And I was trying to be helpful to him. And I was like, okay, so like, what do you do all week? And he's well, he's like, what do you mean? He's like, I play ball three nights a week and I hang out here and I go here. I'm like, but aren't you married? He's like, yeah, but I'm not going to change my schedule for my wife. I'm like, Oh, yes, you are. Like, yeah, that's exactly what you're going to do. You think you're going to be a single guy? Just happening to have somebody when you come back to your dorm room and happens to be a lady in there that you just walk down an aisle? With? Are you out of your mind? Do you have any idea what's what's coming your way? That woman isn't your roommate. That's your wife. He's like, yeah, so why can't I play ball four nights a week? I'm like, because you can't play ball four nights a week if she doesn't want you to. And you gotta, you can't hang out with your buddies. Like, are you out of your mind? Like, the guy, I, I couldn't believe it. And I was I just couldn't believe the conversation I was having with him. He did not want to give up an iota of a single life. He just wanted her to, like, show up and, like, I guess, like, be there when he was playing in his seventh league game. He knew he was married in his head. And I'm sure he enjoyed it. He's a good guy. He wasn't, like, doing this on purpose. He was just, like, out to lunch. There's some wonderful guys out there that are just out to lunch with this stuff. 
and women too, p- to be fair. But somehow the guys seem to get the brunt of it. It just wasn't, she, she wasn't in his awareness. It means that when you're married for a number of years, your spouse isn't even in your head anymore. They're in your awareness. You're aware of them. They're always like a part of, you're always thinking. Like when someone says, hey, you want to go here? You're thinking, you, you don't have to, oh, wait, yes. Oh, right. I forgot. Hold on. Let me check my calendar. I don't know. I, oh, I, I, oh, that's right. I'm married. I'm married. Hold on. I forgot the whole married thing. I can't. I'm sorry. It doesn't. It's in your awareness. There's an expression that sums up parenting in one line. In my opinion, if you want to sum up parenting in one line, here's the line. A parent is as happy as their least happiest child. That to me is parenting. You're aware. And when one child is not thriving at the level you want them to thrive, that's your state. You're not like, oh, right, I got the kit. It's your awareness. Awareness. In, in, there's a concept in, in Torah of what we call a mitzvah to midi, a constant command. And there are six commands, actually, that are supposed to be constant. It doesn't mean you have to be thinking about them every second. You don't set your Apple Watch. It means that you're aware of them. One of them is the love, love of God. You're aware. You're, it's not, you don't have to remind yourself. What we're doing here and the reason why we take our time. And if you're with me, I hope, and I'm, I'm appreciative. Really, I am. We're not running. I'm not trying to get it in in six minutes or less. And there's a lot of great to that, really. I'm all for that stuff, too. That's not what we're doing here. Because we're trying to identify things and let it drip into our awareness together. So that when we identify ideas with God's help, yeah, we get them. But do they become part of us? Are we aware of them? Is it always in our, sort of in the back of our minds? The responsibility of our time. Yeah, that's an easy concept. Like that makes sense. I get it. I control my time. We're living in a a world where we've never had more control of our time ever. And it's only getting more. I mean, like post pandemic, modern world, like you can't believe, I told you the story that that the class that I heard over the holiday from Rabbi Eli Mansour, and he, and he spoke about this and he was hundred percent right. Like we don't even realize and appreciate that. Just like 30 years ago, like, I mean, what would 20? Yeah. 30 years ago, there wasn't even email. I don't think right. 30 years ago, 1990. Right. And Andy knows when email came out. 19. Yeah. There was an email. I was in. A, yeah. I didn't use email in the nineties. Blackberries. I remember we got our Blackberry. It's a Blackberry. You remember the Blackberry? I got it in, in 01. It was like the first one working for a company called Davis Polk and Warble. It was like, you know, the Al Gore campaign and us and like 10 other shops. But like, it was like I walked into a room. It was like the talk of the town. Like I had this massive rock on my hip that didn't even automatically sink. You had to go and put it into a little holder back in your computer. Like we don't remember what communication was like. It just gets quicker and quicker. Yesterday I was, I, for whatever reason, it was, was supposed to be somewhere and I didn't end up there. And instead of like not being able to be helpful to this individual, to this client, we were zooming, typing and sharing drafts in real time. Like it was insane. That would net time. We have more and more and more time. But if we're not going to like stop and take responsibility for that time, when we have it, and if you're blessed to have health, 
if you're walking around today and you are healthy enough and you have hours of your day that is not required for your survival, that means that we got to give an accounting for that time. We got to, that time is going to come back to us and be like, what did you do? Like, I, I, I don't know. I was just having a conversation for an hour and a half about politics. They're like, why are you in politics? No, I just, you know, I read it on the way over. Yeah, I read like three headlines on the way over to the, to the office. So like, I figured like me and three of my buddies who know nothing about anything anyways, can like talk politics for two hours. Right. Our time is going to turn to us and be like, what? Why'd you do that for? That's two hours. You know what two hours is? My aunt just passed away three weeks ago. She was the most incredible woman ever. Ever. Do you know what you would give for two hours? You know what their family would give now for two hours? She just happened to be a fighter her whole life. And so she never, ever took two hours for granted. Ever. That's called responsibility for time. It's not a negative thing. It's actually, a, it, it's going to come across in the beginning as like, oh man, why do I got to think about this for? But after you think about it for a little bit and you, and we, because by the way, I'm just like you, we're all the same. After we take responsibility for our time, in the beginning, it's going to be like a burden. And then all of a sudden we're going to wake up one morning and be like, whoa, I have a gem. I have a gift. I can't, I can't. I mean, the people that I meet, I, I every once in a while, I'm, I'm, I'm blessed. It's not, it's not me. It's God. He's just awesome to me. He's the greatest dad ever. And I'm, he, he introduces me to great people. I hope and pray one day to be one of them. I hope, I hope, but I, I, I know people, you know, people that are great. Look at how they deal with their time. They're so careful with their time. They're so thoughtful with their time. They put their energies and their attention into their time. Great people never kill time. I don't mean just people that are physically successful. That's not necessarily what makes people great. I also don't mean always being, you know, doing work. Spending time with people is part of productive time. Spending time thinking is productive time. Spending time deepening. But when we wake up in the morning and we don't begin our day with a, oh my gosh, especially in the summertime when the days are longer and the sun is stronger and you can breathe more, you're not huddling into the winter. Unless you're from Florida or California, where you get that all year long. But if we're, it, when you wake up in the morning and you go, I got a day, you know how many hours I have? You know how many minutes I have? You know how many things that I can do that are productive? Do you know how many times I could light someone's light up, life up? Do you know how many times that we can light somebody's life up by just leaving a voice note on WhatsApp? Do we have any idea what a half an hour of dedicated time to emails and calls and WhatsApp in intention of making somebody happier could do to us? Do we have any idea? Can you and I imagine for a minute how many people we can touch if we took a half an hour a day and said, this half an hour is only dedicated to making somebody else feel good. That's it. 30 minutes. That's it. And I'm going to leave voice notes for people, wishing them well, checking in on them, complimenting them. Do you have any idea what kind of life we can have when we fill our days, we fill our time with things that are productive? I have a friend who during the quarantine told me that his, um, his significant other got like two degrees, like online, like degrees 
like people are during the quarantine, like just binging Netflix and yelling at the television because their party wasn't properly represented. This person went online and got degrees. Like that's incredible. Incredible. I know somebody who increased their spiritual knowledge by like 7,000%. They were just getting into getting connected to their religion. And then the quarantine hit and they just spent hours studying and thinking. They, they, they grew exp. Why? Because they understood that I have to give an accounting for my time. It means I got to go to bed at night and ask myself, what did I do today? It means I got to wake up in the morning and go, I got so many hours to use. How am I using them? That means when I'm in the middle of stuff that just doesn't seem to matter, I got to stop. When I get that phone call from somebody complaining about somebody else, at some point I'll be like, what am I doing? Why do I keep on talking about the same seven people? This is ridiculous. We're having the same conversation for 20 years. This guy's telling me the same dumb joke for 20 years. We're having the same conversation. I love sports, but I'm not a sports announcer. Do I have to really spend three hours a day delving into sports theory just for the sake of it because I'm in an office? Or because I have nothing else to talk about with my friends? Why can't I just deepen the conversation? Let me read something and then bring that up. I did this once. I remember where we were at some table. I remember I was at some dinner, which are massive wastes of time. I guess in the old days, they were relevant because, you know, you gave honor to an organization. So that's valuable. But you consider it a dinner. I mean, like, I don't mean like a dinner in your house dinner. I mean, like at a, a gala event, you can sit there for four hours and just like, it, there's like, it, there could be 35 minutes of productive time. People are just talking about nothing. I'm going out of my mind. Not that I'm such a great protector of time. No one should think that I'm more, I'm, I'm a nobody. And I also let time slip by way too much. But in this particular case, it's just ridiculous. People are talking about stuff. So I remember, like, I read this book called, um, uh, it was called Keith, um, it was called Never Eat Alone by Keith Ferrazzi. I think his name was Keith Ferrazzi. And in there, he spoke about being vulnerable in conversation and how if you ever really want to deepen, just be vulnerable. So I'm sitting around a bunch of people talking about nothing for like a long time, nothing, weather, nothing. And I just like said something, I forgot what, like, you know, I don't remember. I just, but I was vulnerable. It was like, um, but it was like life oriented. I, I remember what it was. It was like, you know, um, I'm nervous about this or, you know, I'm excited about this. I don't remember, but I remember what it was. It was, it was deeper than what we were talking about. And like, I remember the table or this people around, it wasn't the full table cause it's hard, but the people around me, we started having a real competition and like, it was amazing. Like it was amazing. It was like, we were like in the middle of like real life feelings and growth. It was like, I believe the same people that are like, oh yeah, it's going to get cold tomorrow. And like, yeah, I hope that in six months from now, like, you know, it's warm in May, like whatever. And now we're having a conversation about vulnerability and depth. We could all live this way, but we can't if we don't take responsibility for our time. Leave Andy is tomorrow Yom HaShoah. Is is tomorrow Holocaust Remembrance Day, Andy? I believe it is. And that's what we're going to talk about tomorrow. Because my grandparents were Holocaust survivors. It's tonight, tomorrow. They were Holocaust survivors. I could tell you one thing. What a Holocaust survivor respects is their time. You never have to tell a Holocaust survivor to take responsibility for their time. 
I don't know why I'm starting to, I don't know. We are so blessed. We are so blessed. But we got to own the blessing. Passover. God says, I'm taking you out of Egypt. I'm taking you out of a slave master and I'm giving you a gift called time. But you got to take responsibility for it. You got to own it. Don't blame anybody else. Don't waste it. It's the most valuable resource you have. And we have to take this in our awareness. We have to feel the clock ticking. We have to feel the day passing. We have to look back at our days and our weeks and go, what did I do this week? What did I do today? We have to become people that count time as if we're counting gold coins because time is so much more valuable and we could do so much more with time than we can with gold. And just being aware of it is half the battle. Just going from time just passes to time is in my hands that I use is a major awareness. All right. Let's think about this today. Think about this today. So it's, the, it's, I don't know when you're listening to this, but if you're here live, it's morning. Try this tonight. Just try it. Where you go to bed tonight, just view your day. What did I do today? And just go hour by hour. I bet you that me and you are going to see lots of pockets of waste. Just don't change. Just be aware of it. Just be aware. Because awareness will change it all. For those that are going to be at a program tonight, big night tonight. We'll talk about it with God's help tomorrow. Um, never forget. Never. Remember, my, gra my grandparents, they should have elevated souls. They were always worried about this. And they always were worried. Oh, it starts tomorrow night. Holocaust Remembrance Day. They were always worried that people would forget. Okay, everybody. It's tonight. Oh, it's... Today's Wednesday, yeah. Okay. Have an amazing day. And with God's help, I cannot wait to see you again tomorrow.